Okay, so while Veronica prepares her talk, it's a pleasure to introduce her. Veronica Ufinger is a professor at the Autonoma University in Barcelona. She's an expert of quantum atom optics, and she has very, developed a very interesting research line on the control of the external degrees of freedom of matter waves, for example, by special adiabatic passage. And recently, she has obtained several interesting results on artificial gauge fields, spin orbit coupling for atoms, in particular in various ladder geometries. So thank you, Veronica, and we look forward for your talk. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Anna, for the kind introduction. Uh, before starting, I also would like to thank you and all the rest of the organizers for the invitation to participate in the workshop. It is really a pleasure to be here. Uh, and I will talk about Bose-Einstein condensates trapped in two-stack rings. This work has been done by Eulalia Nicolau and is part of her PhD thesis in collaboration with Jordi Monpart, Bruno Julia Diaz, and myself. I will start with an outline of the talk. First, I would like to do a brief introduction just to motivate the work. Then I will describe the physical system that we are going to consider, just uh, Bose-Einstein condensate in, uh, in two stack rings. And I will also introduce the system equations that we will use to describe the system. And then I will start with the results. First, I will focus on the stationary states and their stability. And I will also show you that uh, we have derived a two-state model that allows us to understand the dynamics after the destabilization of these stationary states. Then I will uh, turn to the dynamical regimes. I will show you the two regimes that will appear in the system and the stability against uh, perturbations in higher order modes. And finally, I will conclude. So let me just start with the introduction. As most of you, or I guess all of you know, uh, the Josephson effect is a fundamental phenomenon in quantum mechanics. And uh, it was studied at the at first times uh, in superconductors. Nevertheless, in uh, 1997, it was predicted also to appear in Bose-Einstein condensates trapped in uh, double wire potentials. In these systems, if we start with an initial population imbalance, what will happen is that the, the, the population will oscillate between the two wells, as is shown in this first uh, picture, where here we, uh, the authors, Smersi and co-authors, plotted the population imbalance as a function of time. Smersi and co-authors also predicted the existence of another dynamical regime, the so-called macroscopic uh, self-trapping, that corresponds to the, the situation in which interactions suppress tunneling and uh, the population, the atoms remain mostly trapped in one of the wells, as shown in the last figure. These dynamical regimes have, uh, were uh, experimentally observed for first time with a single junction in the group of Marcus Overthaler in Heidelberg in 2005. Uh, here, there are also a couple of uh, references regarding the ex other experimental realizations of these Josephson uh, junctions using ultracolatums. On the other side, uh, trapping a Bose Einstein condensate in a ring potential is nowadays feasible, as Wolf has explained us with a, a lot of detail in the previous talk. And uh, he has talked about this time average adiabatic potentials uh, techniques, but there are many others that I'm sure we will hear about during these two weeks. Uh, but nowadays, this is uh, possible. And in fact, this system of a Bose-Einstein condensate trap in a ring trap is one of the most uh, promising candidates for atomtronics, as it is discussed in this recent review, in which uh, one can think of this, uh, this system as potential building block for devices. Once we have a Bose-Einstein condensate trap in a single ring, one obvious question is what happens if we just place two rings close to each other. And due to the symmetry of the ring, we have different possibilities. We can just couple them in a concentric way, side by side, or in, uh, in a stack configuration. All of these configurations have been studied widely in the literature, and here we are just interested in the last one, uh, Bose-Einstein condensate in a stack uh, of two rings. Of course, we are not the first uh, in being interested in this system. 
already in 2007, Lesanovsky and von Klitzing and Wolf uh, predicted the, um, or studied the instability of uh, the non-rotating solutions, stationary solutions in this, in this system. And they also predicted the emergence of angular uh, momentum Josephson junctions for long times. Some years later, there was a discussion about the sign of the coupling and its role in the stability of the stationary solutions. Most recently, uh, there have been a lot of uh, references regarding dynamics. I have just chosen two of them just as an illustration. So there was the prediction of the, the appearance of modulation instability in, the, in a system with gain and losses or the study of tunneling of persistent currents. I would like just to mention that, of course, this is not an exhaustive list of references. It's just to give you an idea of uh, the type of physics that have been studied in the system. This system can be slightly modified by introducing an optical lattice in each of the rings. This modification leads also to very interesting results, as has been uh, shown by um, Luigi Amico and co-authors. Uh, for instance, the prediction of the tunability of the coupling or the, the proposal of using the system as a qubit. Also, the dynamics of uh, vortices in this system has been uh, studied, and here you have a couple of examples. In our work, what we would like to do is we would like to have a deeper insight into the interplay between tunneling, repulsive interactions, and orbital angular momentum. And in order to do so, let me introduce the physical system that we are going to use. So we consider a Bose-Einstein condensate with repulsive interactions that is trapped in two stack rings. We are going to study the system within the mean field theory. So we will use the gross pitevsky equation that is written here using cylindrical coordinates. We have the kinetic part, the, potential, the trapping potential part, and the interactions that, as I have said, we will just consider the, um, the rep repulsive interactions. Regarding the trapping potential, we will have a sum of two different terms, a double well potential along z direction, as shown in the picture, and an harmonic potential centered at rho zero in the radial uh, coordinate. Uh, let me just introduce the notation that I will use during the talk. I will use the letter U to indicate the upper ring and the letter D to indicate the down ring. Here, phi will be just the simultal coordinate. So if we consider that the two rings are weakly coupled, and also we consider that the potentials are steep enough to, uh, in order that the only excitations for the Bose-Einstein condensate would be ex um, azimuthal excitations, one can uh, factorize the wave function in the following form. So here we have the first term corresponds to just the ground state of the radial harmonic potential. Then we have two other functions, this phi u and phi d that are just modes that are localized in each of the wells that we built just as superposition of the ground and the first excited uh, modes. And then we have these he functions that keep the, uh, that carry the dependence with the azimuthal uh, coordinate and time. These functions can be written down as a superposition of orbital angular momentum modes. We indicate the, or the orbital angular momentum with the letter m and the amplitude of the corresponding uh, mode, it will be given by this alpha. If we plug these ansatz into the gross pitevsky equation, we get a set of uh, evolution equations for the, for the probability amplitudes. These are written here in dimensionless form and they were derived in the paper of Lesanovsky and von Klitzing. If we have a look at this expression, we see that the first term is the kinetic term. Then we will have the tunneling term that just couples states with the same orbital angular momentum within, between the two rings. And the last term are the interactions that couple different orbital angular momentum states within a single ring. 
now that we have the, the set of equations, let me start by showing the results about the stationary states. So what we are going to do here is just populate a single orbital angular momentum mode that we are going to call N. The rest of the, the probability amplitudes for the rest of the modes will be zero. Under these conditions, the stationary solutions occur when the two uh, rings are equally populated with half of the population. And one obtains two stationary solutions, the symmetric and the anti-symmetric solution. Lesanovsky and von Klitzing also did the Bogolyubov analysis by introducing a small perturbation in a higher, in an arbitrary higher order mode into these solutions. And what they obtained was that the only the anti-symmetric state can be unstable. Here we plot the stability uh, diagram as a function of the interactions and the tunneling. The pattern regions correspond to the regions of instability and the white regions correspond to the regions in which the anti-symmetric solution is stable. The M means uh, or indicates the difference of the orbital angular momentum of the perturbation with respect to the uh, stationary mode that we are considering. We have checked numerically that this uh, diagram uh, holds. And during these evolutions, uh, what we have found is that when the anti-symmetric state destabilizes, the dynamics that we obtain is something like this. So here we plot the population of the different um, angular momentum modes, so as a function of time. In red, we plot the, the stationary solutions, so the, the population in the zero mode and in blue and yellow, the perturbations in plus, plus minus one and plus minus two orbital angular momentum. And what we see is this, that these dynamics exhibits some increase of the, of the perturbation modes, but followed by a decrease of these perturbation modes and, uh, and this behavior is periodic. Of course, these dynamics cannot be understood just by means of the Bogolyubov analysis. And what we have done is to um, derive an analytical uh, two-state model that will allow us to understand these dynamics. So let me just show you the, the assumptions that we have done in order to derive this model. So we impose the, the as initial condition that the um, each of the rings is populated with the non-rotating state and uh, with a phase difference of pi. And we add perturbations in higher order modes uh, plus minus m with orbital angular momentum plus minus m. And the, these perturbations are equal in both rings. Due to the angular momentum conservation and also taking into account that the stationary state that we consider is the zero mode, uh, these two relations hold, which states just that the, the modulus square of the probability amplitude of one orbital angular momentum mode in one ring is equal to, this, to this, the corresponding one for the orbital angular momentum mode with opposite sign. Also, we assume that the phase difference is approximately constant during the time evolution. And also that the probability amplitudes of the excitation, the perturbations in both rings remain equal, uh, remain equal. Under these conditions, we can define a variable that will be alpha m, that is nothing else than the probability amplitude of the perturbations in both plus and minus m for both rings. Also, we consider that the initial condition, just the anti-symmetric state, that we will define as alpha zero is uh, maintained during the temporal evolution. In this way, the population in each of the rings will be uh, approximately equal and equal to the total population divided by two. Here, just know that the, what we indicate with this uh, population in the upper and down ring correspond to the sum of the modulus square of the probability amplitudes of the stationary state, the the perturbation with 
orbital angular momentum m and the corresponding one with minus m. If we just consider these two new variables, the probability amplitudes for the stationary mode and the probability amplitudes of the excitation mode, and we include it into the full set of equations for the probability amplitudes, one can just derive uh, two couple uh, differential equations for alpha zero and alpha m. So the probability amplitude of the, of the stationary mode and the probability amplitude of the excitation mode. Nevertheless, we have uh, imposed here particle conservation and we have derived two new variables. These new variables are just the modulus square of the probability amplitude of the excitation mode and the phase difference between the, the excitation and excitation mode and the um, stationary mode. By doing that, we get two real coupled equations that are the, what we call this two-state model. And once we have derived this two-state model, uh, what we have done is to study the critical points. So just to study the critical points, this is a standard procedure. So we just e equal the time derivatives equal to zero. And what we get are these four critical points. The first two correspond to the trivial solutions for the population of the excitation, so zero and, and the maximum value. And we get two other um, critical points. We also can obtain the region of uh, tunnelings for which each solution occurs. And by uh, calculating the eigenvalues of the Jacobian at the critical points, we can uh, get that two of them are saddle points and the other two are centers. The uh, existence criteria of these critical points, as we will see in the following slides, will determine the uh, behavior of the system. What we do now is we assume that these two variables that we have introduced, so the, the modulus square of the probability amplitude of the excitation mode and the phase difference between the excitation mode and the stationary state are, conjugate, uh, are canonical conjugate variables. Therefore, uh, we can just write down a classical Hamiltonian. And what we can do is we can just plot the lines of constant h, of constant. And here you have an example. So what we have here is we have assumed that the stationary state is the zero mode. Then the perturbation is uh, the corresponding m equal to 1 and minus 1. So here in the vertical axis, we plot just the population of the perturbation. And in the horizontal axis, we plot the phase difference. So that the two uh, canonical conjugate variables. And this, is, this uh, case corresponds to the uh, case uh, set of parameters of interactions and tunneling for which the stationary solution is stable. And how we can understand that? So if we just consider as initial conditions the, the blue line, like the blue dot, sorry, uh, what we see is that although there are some orbits around the centers, these are unreachable for the, the initial conditions that we have considered. Therefore, the system is stable. We, we uh, have also found another kind of uh, possibilities that are the situation in which uh, we don't have centers and we don't have saddle points. So in this case, uh, the system will be also, the stationary solution that we are considering will be also stable. Let's now see what happens with the other two uh, points indicated in the figure that correspond to unstable uh, solutions. So in this case, what we can do is uh, the same idea. So we plot just the, these lines of constant h for these two set of parameters. And what we find is that there are orbits that can be open or closed. And these uh, orbits correspond to Bogolyubov excitations of the stationary modes. 10 minutes. OK, thank you. 
then uh, what we have uh, analytically is the, the range of uh, tunneling rates for which each behavior occurs. So putting all together, what we have is that the, we can just get, which is the range of the tunneling rates for which the anti-symmetric state is unstable. And what we found is that it coincides with the stability conditions predicted by the volume of analysis. Moreover, this two-state model uh, in, per allows uh, us to derive analytical expressions for the population transfer, and it provides good fit for early times of the dynamics. So here we plot the population of the different modes as a function of time. In black, we plot the, the results for the two-state model, and in colors, the corresponding population integrating the full set of equations. As you see, we get a, a good fit at, the, at uh, early times. And when the time uh, increases, we get first a change in the period and the amplitude. This change can also be interpreted in terms of the two-state model, because if you uh, have a look at, the, at these um, lines of constant energy, what we see is that uh, they are quite sensitive to, um, to perturbations. And one can just um, jump to another close orbit. This will mean just to change the period and uh, the amplitude. Of course, for large uh, times, we get that the two-state model cannot be um, cannot be used to describe the dynamics because assumptions that we have imposed are not fulfilled. Uh, also, sim we obtain similar dynamics for other uh, stationary states, uh, different from the non-rotating state. So let me just go to the dynamical regimes. So in this case, what we are going to consider is an initial population imbalance between the two rings. We are also going to populate the rings with a single orbital angular momentum mode. And we will write down the amplitude, uh, the probability amplitude as a certain amplitude and a certain phase. In this way, we can just define the population imbalance and the phase difference. And by plugging this into the full set of equations, we get just two couple equations for the population difference, uh, sorry, for the population imbalance and the phase difference. As you can see, these equations are equal for all orbital angular momentum uh, states. So we get identical dynamics for all the modes. And in particular, the dynamics that we get are uh, analog to the two well potential. So we expect to have Josephson oscillations and self-trapping. We have derived the self-trapping condition that give us the boundary between the two regimes. Here we have the plot of this boundary with, uh, as a function of the initial imbalance and the ratio between the interactions and the tunneling for different initial phase differences. A corresponds to phase difference equal to zero, and D corresponds to phase difference equal to pi. As you can see, as uh, the phase difference, in difference increases, the region in which the self-trapping occurs increases. When the phase difference tends to pi, the minimum population imbalance for which self-trapping occurs tends to zero. In the inset, we have plot the temporal evolution for three different uh, set of parameters corresponding to the phase, initial phase difference equal to zero. If uh, in the first case, in this case of here, we are well inside the region of uh, Josephson oscillations and we get the dashed line, a perfect uh, oscillation. When we approach the boundary as expected, the oscillations become anharmonic. And when we are inside the self-trapping regime, we get that the population remains mostly trapped in one of the rings as expected. Now, what we would like to do is to study the stability of these uh, dynamical regimes. So we start with an initial phase difference of pi, the anti-symmetric uh, state. And here we plot the boundary between self-trapping and the Josephson oscillations as a function of the interactions and the tunneling. What we do now is we add some uh, perturbations in higher order orbital angular momentum modes. And what we obtain is this plot of here. So let me just explain the color code. So the black region corresponds to stable self-trapping, as in the previous plot. The white region corresponds to stable block oscillations, uh, also as in the previous plot. 
The blue region corresponds to unstable self-trapping and the yellow and green region corresponds to unstable log oscillations. The color uh, gradient corresponds to the decay time. As we can see, the boundary remains the same in the presence of perturbations, but we have some regime of parameters for which uh, the, the, behavior, the, the dynamical regime becomes unstable. If the initial population imbalance is small, we get that the structure that we obtain coincides with the Bogolyubov spectrum of the stationary state. This is just because the initial state resembles the stationary antisymmetric state. But when the population imbalance increases, the structure becomes more involved. Here I have just plot two uh, temporal evolutions for the uh, unstable regimes. So here we have an unstable um, self-trapping. So when the, un, in the lower plot, an unstable block oscillation regime. So as we see, uh, when the perturbations, the excitations increase that are indicated in colors, the, they destroy the dynamical regime. Five minutes. Okay, thank you. Uh, then we have also seen that um, another kind of dynamics appear in the system and are what we call uh, semi-stable regimes where we are close to the boundary between stable and unstable regimes, we get dynamics like this. So what, we, what happens, here we plot again the, mode, the, the population in the different modes as a function of time. And what we see is that uh, a single excitation grows, but then decreases, and this behavior occurs also periodically. But the, the, the growth of this uh, perturbation does not destroy the dynamical regime. And this occurs both for Josephson oscillations and for self-trapping. In fact, if we just sum the population of the different modes in the, of, the, of the two rings for each mode, what we obtain are these plots of here that resemble the dynamical behavior that we get after destabilization of the uh, anti-symmetric stationary state. So in this sense, these semi-stable cases resemble Bogolyubov excitations of the dynamical states, but modulated by tunneling. We have also studied the case of initial phase difference equal to zero. In this case, the, what we obtain is the following. So we have plotted here the same type of diagrams in the presence of the, of the perturbations for two, in, for two different initial imbalances. The color code is as before. The black region corresponds to stable self-trapping. The white corresponds to stable Josephson oscillations. And the gradient colors correspond to different um, uh, decay times of the unstable solutions. What we see is that in this case, we get a much larger region for Josephson oscillations. This is uh, expected because if you remember this, the plot of the boundary between self-trapping and Josephson oscillations, this depends on the phase difference. And uh, when we have phase difference equal to pi, we are in the line D. And now we are considering line A. So the, the region for which uh, Josephson oscillation occurs in line uh, associated to line A with phase difference equal to zero is much larger than the one associated to phase difference equal to pi. And uh, also here, we have to take into account that the stationary symmetric state is stable against uh, Bogolyubov perturbations. Therefore, the, the stabilization mechanism here is not of the Bogolyubov type. And what we see is that there is an interaction threshold uh, above which the Josephson oscillations become unstable. And uh, this mainly depends on the population imbalance. So with this, I would like to conclude. So I have uh, considered a Bose-Einstein condensate uh, trapping a system of two stack rings, and we have studied within the mean field theory. And uh, we have derived a two state model that allows us to obtain the stability regions for the stationary states. This two state model also allows us to understand the dynamics after destabilization. 
and we have benchmarked this model against the full model, obtaining a very good agreement. Regarding the dynamical regimes, we have derived the self-trapping condition, and we have numerically characterized the, this, the, the different dynamical regimes uh, appearing in the system against perturbations of uh, higher order angular momentum modes. And with this, I would like to conclude. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Veronica. So there are a few questions in the chat. OK, so the probability amplitude. I just read the previous part. What is the motivation behind assuming the probability amplitude of the upper and the lower rings to be equal? I Further, can... what if they were not assumed to be equal? Ah, OK, 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 yeah. What is the motivation behind assuming the probability to be equal further, what if they were not assumed to be equal? Yes, so the motivation is uh, is based on the, the dynamics that we have seen. So if uh, we wanted to derive a simple a simple model and uh, based on the, on the observation of the dynamics that we have seen, this is always the case. So when we are in the considering the stationary state uh, with uh, zero orbital angular momentum, uh, the dynamics and, and considering the destabilization of the anti-symmetric uh, state, what we see is that uh, this, um, the population of the, in both rings uh, is exactly the same. And also the perturbations are completely symmetric due to the symmetry of the equations. So this is, and this allows us to really simplify the model starting from six equations and end up to two of them. So the idea was just to find the simplest model that could give us analytic solutions for the, for the system. I... Okay, thank you. So then there is another question from Albert yeah. Gallemi. Yes, what triggers the instability in the case of zero phase difference? In the last part, you mean? Yes, the physical, uh, yeah. so I guess you mean the, this last part, right? So uh, here when the phase difference is equal to zero, we are uh, close to the symmetric state, stationary state, and we know that this is stable. But here, uh, this corresponds to the, the stationary state. Here we are considering an initial phase, uh, an initial population imbalance, in fact, quite large. And we are adding these perturbations. And what we see is that the, the Josephson oscillations become unstable above a certain interaction threshold. So when the interaction, remember that interaction is the term that couples the different orbital angular momentum states. So here is just the role of the interactions that induces this uh, uh, instability. Okay, thanks. Okay, then there is, sorry, another question from uh, Christian Miniatura. Yes, uh, uh, yeah, Veronica, I'm, I'm ju just uh, curious. I mean, uh, are there plans to do some experiments like that? Okay, and, and, and having these two type of traps uh, on top of each other, uh, stacked okay, on top of each other? Well, uh, in uh, fact, I had the, so uh, that, I, that I know there is no uh, group that is interested in doing that at that moment, but uh, seeing the, watching the talk of Wolf, I was uh, wanted to ask him also if, he can do that, this kind of... Uh, yes, of, this is why I was asking the question. He's because trying he, to induce a you know, discussion between the two. Sorry? This is why I was asking the question, in order to get Wolf in, involved. Yes, yes. <laughs> I, I, was thinking, I was thinking the same, because in his so. plots, he was just showing two disks, one over the other, and my question was, it is possible to do two rings, one over, over the other? So the, the answer maybe is from... Uh, should be from Wolf. Yeah, okay. so um, <laughs> we, we are certainly thinking about it. It's it's pretty tough. It's a pretty tough one because um, we're using dressed fields in order to make the uh, to make these rings all of our potentials, and um, the problem is that this is the tunneling probability between the the individual wells. So to get good tunneling, they have to be very close to each other. 
but that means the frequency difference becomes very small. And that means that you then cannot um, you get beatings, right? All frequency differences matter, and that gets difficult. Do you, you understand what I mean? So if you have two frequencies, if it, or three frequencies, which you need to do your three transitions to get two wells, then um, you can treat them as nicely separate frequencies if there's if the frequency difference between these uh, radio frequencies is large. Large enough. Because then that frequency itself has no meaning. It's just a large frequency. If that frequency becomes small, then you run into trouble because then that frequency turns into amplitude modulation, a frequency modulation, whatever. So it, it gets tough. So yes, we are, we're definitely thinking about it very frequently. Uh, whether we will be able to make it very soon, uh, difficult. So we need very large gradients then, and in the current machine, that's a little bit difficult, but it's definitely something we would like to look at. Okay, so we can keep in contact. And, but but I, I think Gretchen, one should maybe ask that question to Gretchen because she has shown us some, uh, some rings and uh, I think that might be not so difficult to do. Okay, so while uh, I'm not, uh, I don't know is if Gretchen can answer immediately, but I propose to take first a question from okay, Gerard. Sorry, sorry to hijack uh, the discussion. Uh, well, it's, it's actually an answer as well. So, so thanks, Veronica, to the, to the wonderful talk. Um, I, I was wondering about the implement, uh, implementation as well. So you showed us that this is one specific configuration about the stack rings, but you showed us also that it's a possibility to have two concentric rings. And I think for Gretchen and us uh, to do two concentric rings might be easier than to have stacked ones. But do you think we, we have the same physics in two concentric rings? No. I don't think so. I don't think so. I have not checked, but I, I would say no. From the, so. So this would be very interesting. So we should talk, maybe it's not identical, but maybe we still can do something similar. Because yes, uh, this is a possibility. Yes, yes, for sure. We can think on doing it in, in concentric rings because if experimentally it's more feasible, we can just try to do the theory and, and see if, if we get something interesting, for sure. Hmm. Okay, then uh, we have a question from Kevin, right? Uh, yeah, so briefly, uh, I think this actually is a doable geometry. We've actually already built a ring with a uh, rather extended vertical aspect ratio, and we've got plans in place for actually setting it up so that it would be a stacked double ring. So this is doable with an optical dipole trap, and it may be a little while before we actually get to that, but that's, that's something we're planning on trying soon. Uh, I do have a question, actually, about beyond the statement, which hopefully it's quick to answer. Uh, these instabilities, I was wondering if this is actually appropriate to think of this in terms of uh, being caused by instability toward having uh, vortex anti-vortex pairs basically form in the junction space, basically having uh, Josephson vortices like in an extended Josephson junction. Are, are you familiar with that sort of phenomenon and know whether that's actually an appropriate description of what you're seeing? So I'm, I would uh, have to think about it because I have not thought about uh, the explanation in these terms, but uh, in fact we are. It should be a relation because uh, we are just imposing this uh, plus minus one, so we have the two circulations of the vortices. So I guess uh, I can try to think more about it and, and answer you by email maybe or. Okay. I may talk with you more later. Thanks. Thank you. Oh, there is another hand from Wolf. So Wolf, would you like to comment something? So I could I could very shortly comment, uh, comment to the in the rings one inside in another. Okay. So we, we've also thought about that. And the problem that you have is that you get dephasing between the two rings due to the angular momentum, the resonant angular momentum or one quantum of angular momentum having different frequency. So any phenomenon that's longer than in, in time than the time of one single rotation uh, will wash out. And since most of the things happening are happening on a longer time scale, uh, I think that will probably not work. Yes, I think it will not work, yeah. I just had a very short comment. I wonder if Donatella Casatari could do this in her uh, spatial light modulator potential. Sorry? 
Donatella Casatari, uh, who does yes. uh, 3D Potentials. Uh, Hi, everyone. <laughs> First time I'm showing myself. Uh, yes, uh, uh, thanks, Mark. Uh, yes, well, in terms of uh, technical capability, um, uh, what we do with the spatial light modulator is uh, quite comparable with uh, what uh, Gretchen Campbell is doing with uh, the digital micromirror device. Uh, well, in fact, what she's been doing is rather more advanced. Uh, so, uh, so yes, concentric rings, uh, yes. Now, stacked rings, um, the way I would go towards that, uh, but this is a general argument, is uh, uh, so you, you produce a, a ring um, with your spatial light modulator. So say that the ring is on this plane, the light coming from the spatial light modulator or the micromirror device uh, comes like this, you know, uh, orthogonally to project your ring here. But of course, you can also look at outside the plane, the light propagates. Uh, and so you have it like a cylinder, if you like. Uh, and then what you can do on that is you just retro, retro reflect and you have a standing wave. Uh, and then you have, uh, well, not two rings, but uh, several uh, rings uh, stuck together. Uh, then you could consider selecting two if you have a very good light sheet uh, orthogonally so that you can, uh, uh, you can just select. But that, that's, not, that's challenging actually, because uh, you need a light sheet to be very, very well, you need to, a light sheet to be very well focused, so. So this is the kind of config configuration that I would uh, I would think about. Uh, you may end up with maybe three or four or five rings instead of two, so maybe it gets complicated. Mm. But that will be my immediate answer. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I'm very sorry to cut the discussion, but it's uh, getting late. So I propose that uh, if you have further my, my discussion. Be, yeah, maybe I can uh, say this, uh, Anna. Yes. Two, two minutes. So so just very quick question. Okay. Uh, can I say I also share my screen? You want to share mm -hmm. your screen? Yes, oh, I want to this share. This is my... uh, when, okay, so we thank uh, uh, Veronica for her talk and we let uh, Luigi oh, share. It's related, it's a question of uh, Veronica. Oh, okay. So this is the uh, device I start, we studied uh, some, some time ago. Actually, it's, uh, just we make uh, the two rings by interfering to Lager Gauss beams. beams. And in, indeed, you can uh, play around with this distance d to make the distance uh, with the uh, different, uh, so to, to, to play with the, to adjust the distance between the two things. So it can be done uh, very easily with two lager gauss, I think. Oh, okay. Then uh, uh, thanks, thanks Luigi for this comment, and I'm sure it will be taken into account by <laughs> the various <laughs> platform which can try to realize that. So um, I propose now to thank then Veronica for her talk.